Hello, everybody. Welcome to the second annual Science Fair hosted by QBI and the Embassy of France in San Francisco. We are focusing on exploring how healthcare is being reinvented by collaborating between borders and disciplines. Thank you very, very much for joining us. My name is Helen Berman. I'm Professor Emerita of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Rutgers. Uh, an adjunct professor at both uh, USC and um, UCSF. Um, I have been involved in the Protein Data Bank since its inception in uh, 1971, and we are now celebrating the 50th anniversary of that resource. So today, we are going to discuss how different disciplines in science and the arts converge to solve problems in biology and medicine. Before we do so, I would like to have the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Uh, and the first panelist who will introduce himself uh, is Alex McDowell. Alex? Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks, Helen. So I'm a professor of cinematic arts at USC. Um, I uh, started my life, my career as a painter in London uh, studying painting. In 1975, I got embroiled in the punk movement, uh, designed record sleeves for Sex Pistols and Iggy Pop. I went to the USA and uh, did music videos for Madonna and Michael Jackson, uh, moved into the film industry, uh, worked on the first film and exploration of virtual reality in 1992. Um, and then along the way worked with MIT Media Lab, um, working on a opera uh, with composer Todd Makover that engaged with uh, robotics and spatialized sound, a video all driven by biometric sensing. So the singer was, uh, um, the, the, the voice and timbre was driving a robot <coughs> and, uh, and video. Um, I finally, in the film industry, uh, or halfway through my career in film, I worked on Minority Report, which was a film by, uh, directed by Steven Spielberg, uh, which led me to my current practice, which is called world building. Um, world building primarily um, deals with looking at the ways in which um, uh, innovation can be driven by um, uh, creating narratives for the future. Um, and so I'm using storytelling and my cinematic uh, skills combined with systems design, design uh, and storytelling systems. Um, we founded the World Building Media Lab in 2012 at USC uh, to really investigate the, really the art science uh, um, space uh, using these um, design narrative and systems. Um, I started off working with Intel, uh, working to test their chips in the mixed reality space. Uh, we flew a giant whale over 5,000 people using scaled AR, hacked VR so that we paired immersive uh, experience with real world uh, hapt haptics. Uh, and that's moved into the world in a cell where I'm lucky to be co-PI with Helen, um, collaborating with a group called The Bridge, uh, who are primarily working in molecular biology. And we've created a system which is um, using uh, a, a kind of system of systems to um, allow uh, molecular biology to be translated out to uh, collaborate in education space, to high school, to undergraduates, and into other uh, disciplines. Um, and this system is kind of developing into a, a, a larger space. And then I uh, co-direct and, and um, creative director at Experimental Design, which is a, a commercial design studio looking at future of innovation, education, corporate space, and uh, entertainment. 
very much, Alex. Uh, Roger. Uh, yeah, uh, hello. My name is Roger Molina. My first career was in astrophysics. I developed new kinds of telescopes, uh, uh, different wavelengths of light, worked with NASA and the French Space Agency, the European Space Agency. But then in 1981, uh, my father died, and I took over a journal that he had started called Leonardo, which documents and promotes the work of artists involved in science and technology and scientists and engineers who use art as part of their research practice. And we've now published the work of something like 10,000, and I'll use the height word hybrid, and I'll get back to that. Um, I was still working as an astrophysicist, and so I started artists in residence programs in space sciences labs. Uh, but then in Marseille, um, I, we helped set up the Institute for Advanced Study, and we brought both artists in residence and scientists in residence into uh, different environments. And that has led to a, a number of scientific discoveries coming out of the collaboration between artists and scientists. Uh, I now uh, co-founded uh, a lab here at the University of Texas at Dallas called the Art Sci Lab, uh, where we try to work on projects which cannot be done unless artists and scientists work on the problem from the beginning uh, and not just artists as illustrators. Um, I'll just give you two quick examples. One was with Jason Gashenschmidt in bioengineering. He was working on drug delivery for cancer, and he was using Petri dishes with bioluminescent bacteria, and the colonies kept dying. And somehow we got into a discussion, and uh, a sound student, music student, and an engineering chemistry student uh, worked together and developed a way of filming the bioluminescent bacteria and you could predict when the bacteria was about to die. And it was not the intensity of the colony, it was the shape of the colony. Um, and so Jash and Schmidt got tenure um, uh, in part because of this art science collaboration. I'm right now working with a PhD student uh, who's a, a student of Carolyn Jones here at UT Dallas um, in more like biochemistry. And he came to me because he's trying to image seamlessly from the atomic scale to the scale of the human body, given that we change um, imaging technologies at every scale, how do you combine those seamlessly so you can just zoom in from the whole body to an organ, to the microbiome, to the uh, molecules? and using uh, augmented reality uh, techniques and so on. So um, just to conclude, um, yes, I'm an astrophysicist and a physicist, but in our lab, what is amazing is the number of students who knock on the doors of our lab saying, oh, I'm passionate about electrical engineering, but also I really, would like to develop my uh, background and expertise in some area of the arts. And um, it's, it's just been striking to me how the university makes it so difficult for students to become hybrid professionals. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Roger. I'm sure we're gonna have lots of discussion about this. Uh, Michael, Michael Nilgers. Right, yeah. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's uh, afternoon, it's almost night here in Paris, but, um, so, uh, yeah, I started out as a phys theoretical physicist. So I studied theoretical physics in Munich um, and also did a PhD in Munich I, um, in, in chemistry, uh, uh, but uh, in the area of structural biology, working mostly with uh, computational methods. So it's already quite, uh, quite a number of uh, different domains. Moved on to postdoc uh, at Yale University doing computational work then to the European Molecular Biology Laboratory um, in Heidelberg, also concentrating on computational aspects. Um, and then uh, about 20 years ago, I moved to the uh, Institut Pasteur, um, which is uh, concentrating on, on biomedical research. I was for quite a while the head of the Department of Structural Biology and Chemistry, um, and now the Vice President of Technology of the Institute. 
And a lot of the efforts at uh, the Institute um, are about understanding the molecular basis of life and molecular basis of uh, disease. And so my current uh, really um, uh, task is to make sure that the technology, which is, I mean, biology is becoming increasingly technology driven, is actually um, uh, up to um, uh, the state of the art uh, to, to actually doing that. So thank you, uh, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Michael. And finally, Jane Richardson, to introduce yourself. Hi, right, everyone. Uh, I have a sort of hybrid career even from the beginning. Uh, I was an amateur astronomer growing up. And in college, I started off as an astronomy, math, and physics major, and halfway through switched to philosophy, which has turned out as well as art to be very important in, in what my husband and I have, have done. We've run a lab together for over 50 years now and uh, started off actually solving uh, the structures of proteins and nucleic acids. Uh, we did two of the first 20 different proteins in the early days. And uh, we started off at MIT in the 60s with free software and have been in, in that part of the movement ever since. And uh, then we moved to Duke in uh, 1970, basically, and solved another structure of superoxide dismutase. It took a long time to do a single structure in those days, uh, but it was always fun from the beginning. And then in uh, 1979, I guess, Chris Anfinson uh, asked me to do a review article, supposedly. It was about half review and half new, uh, illustrating all of the structures up to then. At that point, there were 75 different structures in the PDB, a lot more individual ones than that. And you usually do the structure under different conditions and different species and whatever. Uh, and so I spent a whole year learning how to draw the structures. <laughs> uh, so far, the images that people used were all different from different viewpoints and different representations, different, uh, different ways of showing things. And so it was very hard to compare the structures, particularly when you were just looking at 2D images uh, in a printed paper. And so I'm not really an artist in general. I don't draw other things, but I spent that whole year learning how to draw structures. And if you could put up that slide again. So uh, what I came up with is what I was calling ribbon drawings or, uh, and so, they show alpha helices as coils. I actually had a, a big mail, clear plastic mailing tube that I put some wide tape around in order to look at it from different angles and learn how to show it. And then uh, arrows to the beta strands. And on the beta strands, they needed to have thickness in order to really show what direction they were pointing because I didn't want them to be individual arrows. I wanted them to actually make you see uh, the plane that they were in and the curves. Beta sheet, I think, is, is really lovely. And then, uh, so all of those are driven by the flat peptide plane that's the unit in proteins. And the hydrogen bonds that are in that plane relating to other things, and so on the helix, it's basically a cylinder. It isn't quite, it really tips out a little. And later the, the computer representations could show that tilt a little better than I could drawing it. And then in a beta sheet, the hydrogen bonds go between adjacent strands. And so you want to see the hydrogen bond network implicitly. And, uh, that's actually one of the things that I may show later about an influence of art. 
Um, but I think the big thing that this did was show people how elegant these structures really are. And also the, this very simple representation, it leaves off all the side chains and all the surface and everything else, but it shows you how this long string folds up to make a big active molecule. And then later, uh, we developed a very different kind of representation that shows atomic detail of how the atoms touch each other, and both the hydrogen bonds and just the touches, and then places where the model is wrong and atoms clash into each other, which they can't do. And so uh, that's a very different, much more detailed representation uh, that shows you another aspect of the research. And we needed these representations to understand our own research because the molecules are inherently three-dimensional and even inherently handed. Uh, and so to understand them, and they're also very sensitive to small details. And so to understand them, you need visuals. And even computer-drawn visuals are, are art and are representations and they're subjective. You have to decide what representation you're using and what you're doing with it. And so we ended up getting into the game of trying to find and correct problems with the models using these detailed representations. So we've been having fun for over 50 years looking at them. Thank you, Jane, very, very much. Um, so I think you can, everyone can see that we have a very uh, diverse panel uh, who like to think um, across disciplines. And so I'm going to, we're going to start to have a panel discussion and see how this works out. Um, the first question I'd like to ask, I'd like to direct to Michael Nelgis. Um, conventional scientific research is often siloed into very narrow disciplines. Um, so how do more integrative approaches work and what more can we learn from them? Uh, Michael, do you want to start off the conversation? Uh, let me just say for each question, we're, we're only gonna have about uh, six or seven minutes to discuss. That's, and with this, that may be difficult, but we'll, we'll try, because I wanna make sure we, we address more than one question. So Michael, will you start off uh, by, by addressing that issue? Yeah, sure. A pleasure. Uh, so, um, yes, I think the, for the integrative approaches, I mean, structural biology, which is the, the domain uh, that that uh, uh, you, uh, Jane, and I, I are working in, is a good example of uh, that we really need integrative uh, approaches. So, as my PhD supervisor called it, uh, the structural biology is the physics and chemistry of life. So, you have physics, the concepts of physics, mechanics, thermodynamics, you have complex, complex uh, uh, of, of chemistry with chemical reactions, and you have, but you want to understand how essentially a cell works or how a um, uh, how an organism works uh, from from these basic principles, from these basic natural laws given by physics and chemistry. And so this is actually biology really adds this complexity as. Uh, um, as Roger already referred to, basically we have an enormous range of scales. You have an enormous um, heterogeneity. Um, we have a lot of things, uh, and, and we need really to um, uh, that, are, that are really um, uh, um, uh, unique to biology. But we still think that the basic laws of physics and chemistry um, will, will describe everything. And so basically, we really need concepts from physics, from chemistry, from mathematics, computational uh, sciences, com informatics. Um, and so this, uh, to, to, to come up with, um, uh, uh, with these, uh, this, this understanding, basic understanding of, uh, of life. And maybe I can show the first picture, which is called uh, structure or color. Just showing an example. So basically what we, we, the next uh, question is then how we do we re represent it, how we do we convey the message with even even uh, simple uh, systems are can be actually quite complex. So this is a structure that we solved, uh, which is uh, a bacterial pillars. Pili are important for bacteria to move, to incorporate uh, 
uh, DNA, uh, other substances um, to attach to surfaces, to attach to each other, to attach to the host cell in which they want to invade. And so basically um, what this shows is, is uh, uh, part of one of these pili that, uh, that was solved with a number of different methods with electron microscopy, with um, nuclear magnetic resonance, computational modeling. And, uh, and then you get these, I mean, this is based on thousands of images and you, you need computational methods to integrate all that. Um, and then you need uh, ways to represent it. And you have then thousands or tens of thousands of atoms in this structure. But this inherently, this is actually quite simple. And so what, the way we try to convey this, so the, the person, uh, um, Benjamin Bardieu, who solved the structure, actually uh, uh, came up with this representation is by coloring it. Um, and by using also uh, the, um, the um, total representation that, um, that Jane actually pioneered, uh, sort of simplified representation. We don't see the thousands of atoms. You can see the, the architecture of this. Um, uh, but the other thing that this conveys is that, um, rather than the, the beauty and the elegance that Jane already referred to, is that the colors that we chose and the representation that we chose uh, is not the real life. It is actually um, uh, a representation. And we chose, we chose the colors to actually um, underline the fact that this, this structure is made up of um, a number of identical subunits, uh, which, which are separate. Uh, we went then on, if you look at the second picture called film, I think, um, uh, to study this uh, in more detail, to try to understand this structure, uh, why, it is, uh, why it can actually perform the issues, uh, the, 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 um, the task that it's supposed to do um, uh, by, by studying its dynamics. Dynamics you cannot see um, uh, directly under, under a microscope. These molecules, although they have, they have tens of thousands of atoms, are too small. So we have to use computational methods to predict their dynamics which we did in this case. And so we try to understand of why this uh, is actually so um, uh, so stable and uh, uh, so so rigid and so not, it's not rigid, it's extremely flexible, but it's still so in the resist, resists to force uh, so well. And so what we try to convey with this picture again is Benjamin Bardieu who solved, uh, who's had solved the, the starting structure who do this, uh, who came up with this idea, is that we're actually studying the dynamics of this and so that there is actually a plot behind this, uh, this, this structure. So th what I wanted to, to convey is that we need a lot of different um, uh, uh, disciplines, scientific disciplines to actually address these, uh, these issues in st structural biology. And um, uh, it is unfortunate, um, not only between uh, arts and science, but also between uh, the sciences that this is actually often too difficult um, to, to, to cross uh, from one uh, area to the other. And so structural biology has a lot of physicists, a lot of chemists uh, in that. And at the EMBL in Heidelberg, I was um, very lucky that there was a stream of physicists coming up the hill to actually work in biology, which is less the case in, 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 in France, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, you um, opens up a uh, very nicely to the next question, which I'd like to address. I w by the way, I'd like to have each panelist have a chance to answer a question, and then we'll open up for further discussion um, with everybody. So I'd like to ask Alex to briefly <laughs> uh, address why there's a separation between art and science at all, given um, uh, Michael and both Jane and Michael have now shown how important that that uh, uh, relationship is. So, Alex, can you address why you think there's a separation between art and science? Sure. I don't think there's a separation between art and science. In fact, I think what we've developed in the lab is a word called art science, and it 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 assumes that the only way that we move forward is actually by a complete integration of that. So I come from a film background, as I said. Film is a perfect integration of art and science. The, the ability for film to, uh, to, to move forward is based on the development of science, but the film, the creative process and the, and the, the need for an emotion in an audience demands certain 
scientific and engineering outcomes. So film is, you know, to a large extent, just about light. So how you capture and transmit light involves all of the chemistry of capturing light and moving into the digital. There's an enormous amount of technology in how you integrate digital space now and, and physical um, uh, actors that are, that are um, uh, being captured. Um, but ultimately our job in film is to use that combination of art science to engage an audience empathetically. So I think what we've done in the lab is we tried to take that art science integration, that, that push and pull without which I think Etho can really exist. Um, my design principles are entirely based on systems and systemic um, design, and they are uh, constantly being driven by the challenge of translation, really, the translation of complex ideas into ideas that can be comprehended by a larger audience. So in the lab, what we've been doing is taking the challenge which I was presented with at the beginning, which is how do you convey the complexity of a cell for an audience that doesn't understand molecular biology, um, and developed systems. Well, the, the beginning of that was actually um, having established this, this need for art and science was not no recognition of art science being a single thing. It was was a table sitting between a group of scientists, molecular biologists, uh, structural chemists, the scientists, undergrads, and and um, and 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 scientists on one side, on the other side, uh, artists, graphic designers, architects, um, game designers, engineers, all of whom are, are used to working in what would be called art and staring blankly across this table at each other until we, uh, the, the word origami hit the center of the table. Um, and instantly there was this, this Rosetta Stone uh, in the center of that. And our work had been developing a modular system based on essentially uh, um, collapsing origami into the tetrahedra um, and using the tetrahedron as, as a absolutely pure system of the, the, um, uh, of the elements of the constituents to represent all of the scientific capabilities of each of these. Um, constituents in in this case in the pancreatic beta cell um, the 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 intent or the capability of this system is driven to a large extent by the science of mixed reality now our ability to completely immerse uh, the user in a space that has never existed so what the a big part of the capability of this system is that it is volumetric um, that it is infinitely scalable, uh, maintaining the system. And it allows um, us to compare constituents, I think in the first time ever in a immersive and experiential space in relative scale, in relative position, in time, um, and to see relative behavior, to see the connection between the behavior of, of different constituents and the, the, um, the ways in which those interactions reverberate through the system. But at the same time, the storytelling piece of this, which is the science that I'm engaged in, you know, in my, in my background, is how do you engage those, that audience, the user, um, with empathy? How do you get an absolute empathetic engagement with these proteins, these, these, uh, these components who, that have not traditionally been able to be translated, you know, haven't been traditionally been able to, to be understood. So we, we, as well as creating a scientific system that's being knocked on the head and constantly challenged by people like Helen, particularly Helen, who is constantly kicking us in the butt to make sure we stay um, pure to the science, also creating silhouettes and recognizable constituents that are capable of behaving in a scientific way, but based on a completely pure structural system. So to my mind, the, the ability for this project to move forward and hopefully to create a system of systems that will, can be applied throughout cell and human body and, and architecture, for example, um, 
relies completely on attention uh, and the integration and the collaboration between artists and scientists to the extent that there is no separation. Uh, the, the undergrads in, in the, in the, in the in molecular biology are using storytelling techniques. They're using storyboarding now to explain uh, motion, animation, and, and relative behavior. The artists are using scientific language entirely in the way they create these architectural systems. If you would just bring that illustration up quickly one more time, um, this is an isometric view of the tetrahedra. I don't know if, if you can grab that. Um, Right, um, and and so it's it's entirely using architectural practice, but every single piece of that is being um, driven and described and uh, and pushed in terms of its capability or in its capability um, by the the the, uh, the the needs to express the science, express the capability of the constituents and translate that into a system that right now, you know, Helen's teaching high school students who are completely engaged in empathetic relationship to, to the constituents of the pancreatic beta cell. So, um, so that's, you know, in, in the end, I think what we're really saying is that there really is no separation. Indeed, if there is a separation, then we're undermining our ability to innovate and to move forward. Helen, you're muted. Uh, you've made the perfect introduction to the question I'm going to ask Jane, which is, uh, are there examples of art that has changed science? Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the issue of origami uh, figures very heavily into this. So Jane, would you like to uh, discuss that? Okay. Uh, and I guess I'm going to want slides uh, so we could start off with, with my slides labeled D. Uh, no, I don't think that's D. Let's see. I've got it. Oh, okay. It's actually B that I wanted, but there are a lot of interesting artists who have used the science in order to, to exactly to make an empathetic connection with people. And I have a number of examples from different artists of that. Like this one is particularly dramatic. This man is stressed out by his stress hormone receptor. And, you know, you can certainly see the emotion and understand how important a hormone and its receptor are. But that's the science influencing the art, but uh, it's an example of the kind of communication. How can you get empathy about a molecule? <laughs> so if we could get the, the B set of slides. I'll need B and C. So in my days, everybody seemed to know Escher. And I think I had that subconsciously in mind when I was developing the ribbon drawings. Uh, I wasn't actually looking at it right then, but it was sort of part of my background and what I thought about. And this idea that a ribbon that you can see through uh, gives you not only a front surface, but also a back surface. And so you really can see a 3D object when you divide it up this way. So the next one. The next slide. So this is a scratch board illustration. Uh, my husband's mother is an artist and she got me trying different media. Uh, the best one was pastels, but I only did two of them because it's so hard on something really big like that, not to smudge it. But anyway, this is showing this 
twisted beta sheet as a surface in 3D. And that that is a lot of the basis of the ribbon drawings. And then the third slide. So another example from Escher, I was trying to get across to people that these molecular structures that when you're a structural biologist, you solve in various methods, they're some of the solidest, solidest data in science. Once you know the structure of a given protein and particularly in different environments and what they're doing and the mechanism and so on, that's just there as a given thing. It's not gonna get changed by uh, somebody's theory about how structures work. They just are there, but you can't trust all the details. And so knowing Escher and a way to try and make people understand that this is an impossible structure, that it couldn't be put together this way. And in fact, I think a lot of what explicit images, both in 2D and 3D do for you, is they tell you whether or not your hypothesis and your calculations are internally consistent, particularly in a, in a complex system. You have to be able to make it work in 3D. So then another, maybe more important one is the origami. So if we could go to part C. So origami again, and in origami, you start off with a sheet of paper and the creases on the paper, when you unfold it anyway, are a record of how you make the canary. But unless you're a real Eastern guru of origami, you wouldn't know looking at this sheet of paper that it was a canary. And there are actually a lot of different ways of folding something that looks like a canary. It's sort of like convergent evolution in, in molecular biology. And then the next one. So briefly, this is just showing a small protein, basic pancreatic trip trypsin inhibitor, which would be in uh, that world. <laughs> and it starts off one letter code for each amino acid. Uh, it's just a long word, sort of like verbal magic. And in reality, it folds up in this pattern and structure prediction is the process of taking this word and figuring out what it could be. And now that problem has finally been solved by extensive computation in the alpha fold and Rosetta fold systems, which actually isn't science. We don't understand what the machine learning has learned. We haven't actually learned much of anything from it, but we have a system that really, really works finally after 60, 70 years. So the next slide is how this actually influenced our own science and the origami led, uh, we got really into it because we were asked to give a lecture at a, at a general AAAS meeting to explain why we had a sub meeting about protein folding. And uh, so we used origami to give that lecture. And what we realized is that things like the canary aren't really 3D. They're flat, that you do 180 degree folds to make the canary. And that if you want to get something 3D like this simple box, you have to have 90 degree folds or tetrahedral folds. And so we went looking for those 90 degree folds in the proteins and we found them. So next slide. And they turned out to be the ends of secondary structures. And the 
this was our discovery of helix caps, which took on so fast that most people don't remember where they came from. It, it just it was not only the right concept, but the right word for it. And so in a helix or in a beta strand, you're going in one direction. All of the peptides in the helix point down in this representation from N terminus to C terminus. And how the chain gets into the helix, we call an end cap for the N terminal end. And it actually has peptides that are 90 degrees to each other. So this top peptide is 90 degrees to the ones that are in the helix. And at the other end, there's a C cap where you go out also by making 90 degree angles. And this is one of our notable uh, discoveries in our bioinformatics of structures. And it came from the origami metaphor, really. You're muted, Helen. Um, okay. Um, thank you very much, Jane. That, that answers a lot of questions. And I'm going to ask Roger to give us a, um, a brief discussion of how actually can we produce the Janes and Michaels and Rogers and Alex's of the world? Uh, how do we create hybrid professionals? Uh, Roger? Well, as an artist, I don't follow instructions. So I'd like to actually bring a slightly different subject up. <laughs> just chanting to Alex, Jane, and Michael. Um, about 25 years ago, I had the pleasure of serving on an international jury organized by the Louis Vuitton Moy Hennessy Company. And yes, they make alcohol drinks, they make perfume, they make pretty fashions, they make handbags, and their title of their prize was Science for Earth. How could you use contemporary science to make better perfumes? Okay, so part of me was, okay, yeah, right. Uh, but one of the jury members was a colleague that some of you may know, Semir Zeki, who's a neuroscientist. He originally studied uh, the visual cortex. And he then founded a field called neuroaesthetics. And he held an annual conference each year on a different sense vision, smell, taste, touch, proprioception, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, one of the things he said that just changed my way of thinking, he said, you know what artists really do? They're experimental neuro neuroscientists. They're find out, trying to find out what patterns attract the attention of humans. And the easy version of that, uh, Alex has a, something behind him, uh, and my visual cortex has edge detectors. Oh, he has glasses. I immediately look inside the glasses as it I, at his eyes, not outside the edge. And so Semmer Zeki's argument was that really what artists can teach scientists is how to help you recognize patterns in your data. Um, and, you know, it sounds so simple, so I, I encourage all the art students that work in my lab to take neuroscience courses. You know, they need to understand how the human brain recognizes pay, uh, patterns. What is the human brain paying attention to? You know, in the ribbons that you showed, you made them very different colors. Why? It has nothing to do, but the, the visual cortex breaks colors down into different bins. And so then you trigger visual recognition by uh, using certain colors and not others. So I, I'm just going to stop there on the um, on the neurobiology aspect. But uh, I think it, it's sort of a theoretical angle of attack on why artists and scientists should work together. They're both trying to rec uh, recognize patterns and bring the attention of humans to certain patterns. Uh, and so I, I'll stop there on that one. And if you'll give me two more minutes, Helen, 
so one of the things that you and I discussed, uh, one of the other people that changed my cognition in the last five years was an, is an amazing woman in the business world called Mary Beth Burke. And she wrote a book called Not In My Title. All my career, I had two CVs. When I was a scientist, I hid, I didn't put in my CV, my work in the art world. Because my promotion in science, oh yeah, you're doing a little bit of science outreach, you can do that on the weekend. When I was on art juries and you know, when I was solicited for work in the art world, they didn't care how many science publications I'd written. When I came here to UT Dallas, I got to combine my two curriculum vitae's into one title. I am a professor of physics and a professor of art and technology. And boy, is that difficult. I go to twice as many faculty meetings. <laughs> and boy, do people think differently in different disciplines. You know, I, I get like a cognitive shock when I go to the physics department faculty meeting and the art department faculty meeting. Um, Mary Beth, uh, Sarah Beth Burke uh, has a wonderful website called Not In My Title, where she argues we need more and more experts like astrophysicists who, need, who know more and more about less and less. Yeah, when you're hiring an astrophysicist, you want to know the depth of their knowledge in astrophysics. And you need to hire deans and provosts and university presidents who know less and less about more and more. Oh yeah, I think I know what a photon means. Uh, is it the same as a prion? Um, uh, no, I think not. But university presidents need to know less and less about more and more. But then her argument is on difficult problems, we need billions of hybrids. And I, you know, Alex is an, ex you know, an example of someone who came from the film and entertainment industry, give me a break and is bringing in his knowledge into difficult scientific problems. And so universities make it very difficult for young people who have hybrid interests. Uh, one of my PhD students, Catherine Evans, is a music teacher, and her PhD is she studied the thousands of students taking her music classes. And they, it was full of engineers and business students. What did they get out of it? Relaxation? No. Musicians are amazing at recognizing patterns, <laughs> at creating patterns. Uh, and so she documented how, and she now uh, in our lab runs a program co called Arts-Based Learning for Business People. Uh, and her techniques can be Arts-Based Learning for Engineers. Now, I, we're not saying everybody should do this. We need experts and we need generalists, but we need billions of different hybrids and the universities don't know how to cope because if you're combining two disciplines, you need about 60,000 separate departments. Astronomy and physics, oh, astrophysics, biology and chemistry, biochemistry. So hybridity is almost impossible to matched the way universities are structured. So maybe we should look at how the body is structured and structure universities in a different way. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bordeaux had asked the question, how can we train the workforce course differently in order to be able to tackle these multidisciplinary tasks, uh, which is, I think, uh, what you addressed, but then he asked the question, do we need T profiles or V profiles? And I'm, I have to admit, I don't know what that means. Can somebody tell me what that means? Do you know? East and you and I need to talk. So in Dallas, when I came here from France, the companies were saying, you know, we never hire your engineering PhD students. They don't know how to do engineering. They need to be T-shaped. The many the, they end up in a company, oh, the engineer has to work with the data scientists and oh, the engineer has to work with the marketing people and they don't know how to do it. So, you know, the, the vocabulary T-shaped. IBM then introduced a different term 
which was new color. We should pe teach people to have a new color. So you may start your career as a blue collar worker, but maybe you'll end as a white collar worker, but maybe there are all other kinds of color, color colors that we need in companies. So you, you talked about T-shaped uh, v, v profiles. So yes, companies need experts, but they also need people who are T-shaped, Y-shaped, V-shaped, because they're the ones who can attack a new problem and maybe solve it in a way that the expert cannot. I'll stop. So that's very interesting in terms of the way in which uh, courses are offered and the way in which education happens. Um, you know, I believe that it's really important that you learn how to think deeply about anything. It doesn't matter what it is. So there has to be some balance in learning how to think very deeply about something, chemistry, physics, art, whatever. But then there needs to be this other um, part of the education which encourages um, multidisciplinary um, thinking, thinking outside, like if you're a science major, um, making sure that you've had appropriate understanding of our culture and, and, and the arts. And I'm not sure, back in the day, my day, which is a long time ago, um, I went to a liberal arts college, so we had no choice but to learn that way. I think uh, Jane is pretty much the same way. Uh, but um, these days, I feel as if the university has become a um, almost like a trade school. Um, and so we're not really um, giving that, that opportunity to just hang out and talk about something you might not know anything about and learn from other, cla other classmates about subjects that you don't really have any understanding of. And I'm not sure the university allows, it's, is structured that way anymore. I might be wrong, but I feel as if that's true. Jane, would you like to comment, or, or Alex, do you want to comment on that? It, uh, well, no, please, Jane, carry on. I'll, I'll jump in after. Well, I never got a PhD. I didn't, didn't, I looked, it, my deep learning expertise was really from the philosophy. And that's, it teaches you how to question everything, particularly your own assumptions. And that's a lot of what, Dave and I have used in, in our careers. Yeah. I, I really think a large college is the way you get started and you can do anything from there. Yeah, that's I, that, I'm a really strong believer in that. Alex, do you have a comment about this? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I have, don't have a PhD either. I'm not sure I have any uh, um, qualifications, but what I have seen is that, that uh, for instance, in my studio, I cannot hire a uh, single specialist because we shift um, from the initial problems. We use completely different solving um, devices, uh, but depending how those problems evolve. So if I hired a specialist one field and we shifted to a different solution, then they would be useless. But I think it's, so a couple of things. One is that I think there's a perception this becomes jack of all trades, master of none. And I think that is absolutely not true. But I do think that, so I think that there needs to be a sort of dominant area in each of us uh, of, our, of our ability to add significant depth. But the ability to translate and understand and read each other, and therefore to be able to be collaborate um, integrally. But I think to Roger's point, you know, I think we are all the victim of the dreadful uh, uh, damage that the Victorian industrial system did, that the universities we're dealing with are, are dealing with absolutely archaic methods of teaching. Um, and I think, I, I think Roger and you and I are saying the same thing, but I think actually that we need schools that are, that have less departments that are hybrid and that these redefinitions of what hybrid means actually creates um, tighter 
uh, spaces for that. And I think if, you know, the, the schools are doing a great deal of damage by remaining in these separate spaces. So, Michael, you're in a completely different educational system in Europe and in, in France. Do you have any comments about how this, I mean, you're very broad in your thinking, so that happens somehow, right? So well, what do you think? So, so it's very different in Germany, uh, at least when I studied, uh, than it is in France. So in, in France, it, the system is highly streamlined so that you have to have a, a little bit like in Great Britain, you have to have a particular combination of good marks in particular subjects in high school uh, to be able to move on to, to that subject in, uni in university. And in, in France it's even worse, basically, if you are very good, you actually go to an engineering school and you, people are then a little bit lost for science in a way because, because you, you, you get to, 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 into a completely different track. Um, so, uh, so I did actually, my, my high school was actually uh, in ancient languages, so I did not, uh, not do science uh, before starting, I mean, uh, very little science in mathematics before starting university, which was a, a disadvantage in the beginning, but in, I think in the end it was, uh, it, 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 uh, it helped uh, broaden my, my point of view. And uh, so my daughter, did the same essentially here in France, but then she moved to Germany to study. So she studied biology and then essentially went back to more to the arts because she's working in communication. Um, so uh, so I don't think it's it's so different. I mean, they, 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 uh, in France at least, so they're there, there are sort of these borders between different disciplines um, uh, in science and it's actually quite difficult um, to move from one, one area to the other. Um, which is unfortunate, unfortunate. So, um, so we have a, uh, a question from the audience. Um, do you believe that there should be an artist with no scientific background embedded around every scientific lab? Should this, should this be the new model? And I'm going to ask Roger to answer that question. Okay, so I think, um, I think we have a unfortunate bias for symmetry and yes, no questions. So I think uh, labs need to be porous. There are times when they should be very siloed and very focused. And then there are times when maybe you let different ideas and methods flow through the lab. So I think part of the challenge is how you design a research lab so that for 40 years, you only think one way. Uh, and we all subscribe to creativity and innovation theory uh, and so on. I just want to end um, in my reply to Jeff with a provocation. So, uh, and actually picks up on, um, I think it was Michael's comment about Victorian education. I just gave a talk at the Pompidou Art Museum in Paris. The topic was how to teach differently and I believe they're ahead of my university on that thinking. But we also discussed how to learn differently, drawing on contemporary neurosciences. How does someone actually learn something? Well, we still use Victorian methods. And part of that is we should teach students to cheat. Yeah, you can use your cell phone anytime you want to look up the answer, but how do you know if what you looked up is right or wrong, has been checked, is it fake? The real skill in learning is verifying the validity of information you receive. So yes, let's teach people to cheat, looking up all their answers on the cell phone, but let's teach them how to verify the validity of what they found on their cell phone. Um, and finally, um, to end my provocation with a second one, I'm an ethical and moral atheist. That's the family religion I grew up in. We celebrate uh, holidays of all religions, which gives us about three months a year of holiday. Um, but last week, I gave a talk in a Jesuit college because a colleague and friend of mine, an artist, a computer artist, a member of the group of the algorists, 
invented a lot of early computer graphics and computer art methods. He invented the algorithms that scientists end up using. But I found out he was ordained as a Jesuit priest. He never wore a collar. He changed his name when he was uh, became a priest. Boy, Roger, we have uh, we have thirty seconds left. So my provocation is: in, let's include in the porosity of how we work people we don't trust because they believe different things. So yes, sometimes a Jesuit college has brilliant ideas that may happen in it. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists. This was um, very provocative. Um, and, and we, I think, uh, have so many areas of, of agreement about how we do things. Um, so I think, uh, thank uh, Alex and Roger and Jane and Michael for very stimulating um, conversation and uh, thank uh, QBI for um, organizing this um, meeting. It's been very interesting to for all of us. So thank you very, very much. And uh, with that, I will say goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.